good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is William Green. I work with the Alabama Farmers Federation as a commodity director in Alabama, uh, where I cover forestry, wildlife, and catfish programs. Uh, excited today to be with you all and be the kickoff speaker for the center stage on the trade show. Talk a little bit about wildlife damage and mitigation and what we're doing in the state of Alabama to try to get a hold of some of the wildlife damage that we're incurring on an annual basis. So Alabama, to kick us off, uh, you know, is mostly a forested state. So. When you're covered mostly in woods, there's plenty of opportunities for critters to come out and cause problems. We have a laundry list of animals that always cause issues. Everything from black vultures with our cattlemen to uh, beavers with our timber folks to wild pigs and deer, obviously from the topic title today. Um, really, you can kind of pick from a laundry list to figure out what they're causing damage on. So today we're going to talk mostly focus on our wild pigs and deer. Uh, and to get started, I am going to focus on probably the more unsavory of the two and talk a little bit about wild pigs. And do that, it's always best to, to introduce the problem, talk a little bit about the history, why we have the problem, what the problem is, and then talk some about what we're doing in Alabama on a state, local level, as well as nationally to try to get a hold of the issue. So pigs are what we call, and I should start by saying, wild pigs, feral swine, feral hogs, boar, razorback, whatever you want to call it in your hometown, it's all the same species. I'm sure somebody will probably argue with me out there, all the same animal, they look just about the same and everywhere you go. So um, I use wild pigs and, and the reason for that is honestly just because it sounds the least impressive. Uh, for us, you know, we try to think of wild pigs as a nuisance animal and what can we do to get rid of them is one thing is to devalue them. So to devalue them a little bit, we kind of use a name that makes them sound, you know, not as cool, so to say. So. Pigs are what we like to call a non-native invasive species, which means exactly what it sounds like. They are non-native to North America. Uh, they originally got here from our Spanish explorers. Uh, think Hernando de Soto when he came through Florida and the rest of the southeastern United States. He brought pigs as a free-range food source for his crew. Um, over time, some pigs got out. They were able to breed and survive on their own. But if you fast forward about 200 years later, um, our early settlers brought um, part of their sporting heritage from Eastern Europe over to continue hunting. Uh, that's the Eurasian wild boar. So the pigs we have now are kind of a combination of that domestic pig that uh, DeSoto brought as well as some of those hunting boars that were brought over from Europe. Um, pigs were able to survive for a couple different reasons. One, they can survive pretty much anywhere you put them, right? They are able to live in the arid uh, environments in Texas, all the way through the swamps in Florida, Louisiana, uh, all the way up into the snowy conditions in Canada. They really can thrive wherever they go. Um, on top of that, we like to call them uh, in the biology world, we say they are opportunistic omnivores, which is just a fancy way of saying they'll eat whatever they can get their mouth around, whether that's pine seedlings, fruit vegetables, acorns, uh, your row crops, think peanuts, soybeans, corn, cotton, uh, really anything. There are some studies that show that they've uh, done some content studies on their stomach and you've seen um, deer remains, crawfish, amphibians, so again, whatever they can find, they're going to eat. Additionally, they are prolific breeders. Those of you who've either been in the pig business or um, you know knew somebody that was will tell you they can they can reproduce really quick. Sexually mature at six months of age, um, they can have about two litters every 18 months. Those litters range in size anywhere from about six to 12 piglets. Um, and on top of that, there's no native predator. So live anywhere, breed quick, and nothing's out there to kill them. So all of that comes together as almost a perfect storm to create a apex nuisance animal, so to speak. Now, you'll notice that I did not give them credit for their long distance travel capabilities, right? So pigs are able to get all over the country uh, pretty much the same way they got here, right? But rather than being on a boat sailing across the Atlantic, they're in the back of pickup trucks going down state roads. So to talk a little bit about what we've done in Alabama to combat that issue and try to mitigate some of the damage and spread of pigs, I'll start at a local level. Moving wild pigs is a major issue in a lot of parts of the country. Uh, I see a lot of people nodding their heads. You probably know in your community of a hunting group or somebody who brought them for extra food or sport, whatever it was. So in Alabama, what we did is we increased the penalty for being a, a kind of a slap on the wrist fine to making it more um, Pretty, pretty significant uh, in terms of if you get caught moving pigs. It's now a class B misdemeanor for us, as well as a mandatory fine and possible jail time if you get caught moving pigs. So we're taking it pretty seriously in Alabama. 
On a national level, some things that I want to talk about and bring your attention that, that you either may be aware of, may not know enough about, or you should be aware of. There are two federal programs that I want to talk about that we've been really heavily involved with that we think have made a difference in Alabama in terms of pig damage. The first is the National Wild Pig Damage Mitigation Program. Uh, this is housed in USDA Wildlife Services over uh, just to our east in Colorado. Uh, they are a relatively small group of USDA, but they are in just about every state where you can find pigs, and they're responsible for technical assistance to landowners and farmers, researching the latest uh, technologies, including toxicants. I can't talk about pigs and not mention toxicants, uh, as well as trapping technologies, new uh, opportunities to uh, maybe stop the breeding so quickly, a whole lot of different things that, that go into the wild pig damage management. One thing that's been really critical for those guys in Colorado is over the course of about five or ten years or so, their federal funding or annual funding has increased. Uh, when, when we first started looking at it, it was around $20 million per year, and today it's a little uh, under $35 million. So they've almost seen a double in their annual budget, which has done a really uh, big service for farmers who are able to use them to get technical assistance, such as professional trapping, or in certain areas they can use the helicopter to do aerial gunning. A lot of different opportunities there, and if you're not familiar with it, I, I'd really recommend you look into it. The other program federally that's kind of the new I guess the shiny toy to look at, talk about, is in the 2018 Farm Bill, uh, a new program was put in place that was called the Feral Swine Control and Eradication Pilot Program. That's a mouthful, I'm not going to say it again, but it basically put $75 million uh, into USDA to look at different parts of the country and what could we do to make a difference with wild pigs. Pretty unique program. It was split 50-50, that allocation was. 50% went to NRCS, and the other 50% went to Wildlife Services. Um, at that point, it kind of was spread to about 10 or 11 states around the country that have the biggest pig problems. And from there, the federal government said, hey, it's up to the states, figure it out. Every state that was involved did a little bit differently. Uh, in Alabama, which is you know our, our experience, what we did is we got all of our partners together. NRCS, Wildlife Services, the Alabama Farmers Federation, State Conservation Department, um, Auburn University Extension. Everybody who kind of had some stake in the game was, was there to talk about what could we do to make it better. So the way our program was laid out is that we identified three different areas in the state that we were going to try to really work on drastically reducing the number of pigs. These three areas were geographically different, uh, I would even go to say culturally different uh, from Alabama friends, as well as they were uh, very different in terms of what they produce agriculturally. So what we did, without going into too much detail, basically NRCS was there for cost share. Uh, they worked with landowners and farmers to really offer a rebate to drastically decrease the cost of traps so people could get traps and do a DIY management effort. Um, and then Wildlife Services continued their technical assistance. They were able to get involved with landowners, do sharpshooting, trapping for the landowners, in some instances use the helicopter to remove pigs. And what we found at the base level was the program was a, was a pretty good success. Over three or four years, we were able to kill and remove thousands of pigs from Alabama through this program. We dug a little bit deeper to try to find out, okay, what can we do to improve? And what we have found is that maybe the, to improve and make it better, we can change the way that money is allocated a little bit. Cost share is important, and I, I think it's great, but what we have seen in Alabama is it made more, more sense to put more money into the technical assistance side. And I know what some of y'all are thinking out there. I don't want the feds on my property. I agree. I don't want them on my property either, right? But when you think about it like this, you're farming. You wake up every morning early. You're either planting, harvesting, maintaining equipment, working hard, work all day. Afternoon, you have homework to help with, pick up the grandkids, t-ball game, dance recital, church, waterworks board, county, uh, county federation or uh, farm bureau meeting, church, whatever it may be, you have something else going on at night. Now you come home, you go to sleep, finally get to go to sleep, right? Ding, ding, two o'clock, your phone's going off, and you've got pigs in a trap. Now it's up to you, what are you gonna do? Are you gonna wake up and take care of the problem right then and there? Or are you gonna say, ah, maybe I can get them tomorrow when I feel a little more rested? What we found is that originally, uh, when that program started and you get your trap and it's shiny and new, you're really excited, really gung-ho on out there to, to get rid of pigs. But as it trickles down, you start getting less and less enthusiastic about waking up in the middle of the night and getting rid of the animals. So, what we think in Alabama, uh, and kind of what we're going to try to start pushing for, is maybe a little different allocation in that program if it gets removed in the next farm bill, which we, we think it will. But change the allocation and maybe get more technical, professional people out there to change uh, the way the landscape looks in terms of pig management. Switching gears a little bit and thinking uh, about a different species for us in Alabama, you know, that's 
almost a cultural 180 for us. Um, in Alabama, white-tailed deer is a really important species in terms of hunting, um, our heritage in the state, um, and it's very interesting to think that in the last two years we have heard more and more complaints and issues with farmers with deer damage. So for us in Alabama, in the early 1900s, we almost totally eradicated deer on accident. We almost hunted them out of existence in the state. And through a pretty involved and intense uh, re, uh, repopulation and restocking effort, we are able to get our populations back up to where they are today. And some people would tell you, in some parts of the state, we have too many. Um, so it's a kind of a weird cultural thing when you talk to some of the folks who remember hunting or being out in the 40s and 50s. Like my grandfather can tell me the first time he saw a deer was in the early 1950s. To me, which is insane, because I saw 50 last weekend, right? So it's an interesting, to think, it's an interesting thing to think that now we have a problem with having too many deer. So through all these complaints and talks we've had across the state in Alabama, uh, what we decided to do is form a study committee to look at the problem and, and try to figure out what we can do as an organization to offer solutions or fix it or alleviate some of those pain points. So that study committee was made up of 12 of our members that really had a pretty diverse um, operation experience. We had timber landowners, we had lodge, hunting lodge owners, we had row crop folks, we had people who offered crop insurance, we had uh, specialty crop folks, livestock folks, we ran the gamut, right? We had everybody that could have an opinion in the room. And we invited special guests from Department of Conservation, researchers with Auburn, folks from the insurance company to talk about uh, deer collision damage uh, data. And after a really strong and good conversation, we were able to come up with four main components that we thought as a uh, state organization that we could do to really fix or impact the problem on the ground level. So. The first four, or the first two, kind of go hand in hand, and they're, they're kind of a, an interesting thought on it. First, we need to do a better job of educating hunters that it's okay to remove deer, right? And Alabama, and those of you from not in Alabama, I may say something that's going to sound totally insane. We have an incredible bag limit for whitetail deer. Through your basic hunting license in Alabama, you are legally authorized to kill up to 120 deer throughout the deer season, right? That's insane. You look at other states, I think Mississippi's maybe, what, 15? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's hard, hardly anything when you compare it to Alabama. So the issue is people aren't going to do that. You have a lot of what I call the weekend warrior folks who have a lease, and, you know, they only get to hunt two or three times a year. And when I get to the woods, I want to see a pile of deer. I get it. I'm a hunter. I'm guilty of that, too. So what we decided is we need to do a better job of telling folks that it's okay to remove deer. It makes your weights go up which means they're becoming more healthy. You have healthier fawns, better recruitment, your bucks get bigger. Everything you can think of in terms of deer management is improved as long as you maintain that population ratio. But to do that, because again, I already said that it's a pretty culturally important animal for us, nobody wants to just remove deer for nothing and just leave them in the field, right? So one of the critical components that we're working on now uh, is trying to figure out what we can do to better improve the avenues to donate venison that's been harvested. Alabama, we've got plenty of school systems, plenty of homeless shelters, plenty of prisons, plenty of animal shelters that could use a free, healthy, nutritious, free-range meat, right? It, it could be a really good fit if we could just find a way to get that meat in the right hands. So that's one of the things we're working on now is how are we going to be able to improve that effort. The other two things that go along with it are, one, we need to encourage our land managers in the state to improve habitat. Um, this is kind of a interesting thought, but, you know, in Alabama, like I said, it's mostly forested, but if it's unmanaged forest, there's not a lot of native browse for our deer. So they're going to walk a pretty long distance and get to your soybean field, which they view as a all-you-can-eat buffet, right? So for us, we have a lot of tools available to manage our forest. Prescribed burning is a great, simple, easy way for us to do it in the southeast. We're able to do that. We can burn, change the way it looks, offer native uh, browse for these deer, and they won't go as far to get to your soybean fields, and ultimately it will reduce damage. The other is we need to make sure that our farmers and landowners know about the programs that are already available to them so they can use. We have a depredation permit system that they can use to increase the number of deer they can harvest. Uh, we also have a um, something called deer management assistance program, which is the same thing but for the hunting side. So there's a couple different ways that our folks can get involved. All of those things are put into a policy recommendation that is now in the Alabama Farmers Federation policy book. Uh, we're already starting to work on some of those efforts through uh, our magazine, podcast, different educational seminars. It's something that we're trying to take seriously on the staff level.
So to, to wrap up, I just want to offer two kind of thoughts uh, as, as you may go home and think about what can we do for wildlife damage in our state. One, get involved, right? Sounds so easy, but the relationships we have in Alabama due to involvement from our members and staff on conservation boards, um, wildlife advisory groups, uh, public land management conversations, all those things have opened a lot of doors for us. The second is to be realistic, right? In, Al or in, in the United States, hunting and fishing contributes up to $150 billion annually to an economic impact. That's a pretty big deal. For Alabama, that's a $3 billion impact. Uh, and specifically where I live, which is a pretty rural, poor part of the state, in the Black Belt, that's a $1.4 billion impact. That's huge to that community. So it's important to think that as we're managing, we want to decrease the number of wildlife damage incidents. We also want to be good stewards, right? We're called to be good stewards to manage the natural resources we have. By doing that, we can also protect a, a really important economic driver for rural Alabama and rural America and make sure that we're accomplishing both by blending a good common sense approach to wildlife management as well as respecting our uh, stewardship opportunities. So thank you very much. I know I'm out of time, but if you have any questions or any comments, uh, you want to yell at me later, I'll be over on the side. I'll be happy to talk to you. Thank you very much. I want to welcome everybody uh, to discuss some solutions for the rural and food systems veterinarian shortages. Quick audience check, any veterinarians in the audience? No, one right here. Thanks for what you do. Any livestock producers out there? How many of you need a vet? Got one? No, it's good. Nice to be here. Uh, Todd Greenwood, I'm with the Farm Journal Foundation. Uh, we're, uh, we'll go through a little bit about us, but uh, my background of all the 35 plus years worth of work that I've got, the thing that's most relevant is uh, my dad's a practicing veterinarian in rural Western Indiana, so my title as Doc's boy was probably the one that matters most for this conversation. Uh, same practice since 1978 in the same location. Uh, and, and this is a, so this is personal to me and, and it's a really critical part of the work that we do at Farm Journal Foundation. So a little bit about who we are. Uh, you know, Farm Journal Foundation, we, we care about global food security. We come at it a different way. Uh, we are DC based. We're uh, obviously the not-for-profit side of Farm Journal Media. You've heard uh, who everybody knows. Uh, this is, our, part of our work is uh, to, to drive different parts of thought leadership. Through, we do it through education and we do it through policy engagement. Uh, but the biggest thing is, we want to come up with solutions. And so part of why I'm here today is we've embarked on this, then this work in the uh, rural and food systems veterinary shortages and we think we have some opportunity to, to bring help and, and aid to the, to the cause. So the four areas in which we work in, in, in the most is government affairs. And, and when you think about uh, uh, global food, ag research, we do a ton of work making sure that there's investment in agricultural research so that the farmer producers in the US have the best technology and innovation that, that they can get. Uh, we also uh, work in the uh, global, food, uh, global uh, food security and agricultural development. Again, helping developing countries go from aid to trade and helping U.S. agriculture to be export import positive and, and to help uh, food insecurity around the world that ends up being national security if it's not taken care of. We also work in conservation and resilience. So, uh, we'll cover it in a second. We have a, a really great relationship with USDA and some of the work that we will do uh, with them. Uh, education, uh, we have an education platform. Our, our partners at Dirt to Dinner, uh, we're also use that platform with the American Royal Kansas City as they get ready to open up a new facility in a couple years. And then we also do that work with the National Association of State Departments of Agriculture. But the, the big reason today is rural development. So uh, the Zoetis Foundation has funded our work so far in the veterinary space, but we're very, very happy to have also been awarded a grant from the Native American Agriculture Fund uh, to address some of the issues that, in having a centralized database and helping them. And obviously, and when you think about tribal uh, farmers and ranchers, they have a shortage of, of veterinarians as well. One of the key ways that we get things done is through our farmer ambassadors. Uh, this is a fantastic group. Uh, many Farm Bureau members on, are on there. Uh, right now, I think uh, Brad on the map from Arkansas and Roselle from Washington are here. Uh, these are the folks that will travel to DC. They also hosted last year five in-state events. So they will partner with the university. They'll have them on farm. Uh, elected officials are there. 
Uh, the veterinary piece came together uh, uh, last year, two years ago, actually. We were in Mississippi State. Senator Hyde Smith was there at Mississippi State University. We were talking about ag agricultural research investment. Found out, she found out we were working on the veterinary shortage, and she pulled that into the conversation that day, only to find out that her daughter had been accepted to Mississippi State's vet school. So now this idea is, this is personal to her, uh, and she's been a, a great advocate uh, for the cause. But these ambassadors, uh, we, we, you know, they support uh, everything that you do and everything that, that we do there at Farm Journal. The USDA, so conservation and resilience, we've got a Climate Smart Commodity Grant working on uh, tribal grazing practices, Montana, Oklahoma, and Florida, just beginning that work. We're very excited uh, to support those, tr those Native American farmers and ranchers. We have a cooperative agreement with uh, USDA and NRCS uh, that gives, uh, that we work with our partners at Trust and Food. That's uh, part of uh, Farm Journal's uh, system there. And this is in our third grant, our third cooperative agreement with them, uh, working in states to uh, uh, advance uh, adoption of climate smart practices. And then we also are part of Trust and Food's larger U climate smart commodity grant uh, where they're doing some of the similar work. So uh, really excited to be uh, handling that. But while we're here today, so the, the food system shortages, let's talk about why this matters. You know, I mean, I mean, a lot of you think, you know, I need a vet, but let's put the numbers on it. Uh, uh, Barrett Nelson's here from, from Farm Bureau and, and an economist. I am not an economist, so one caveat here, the numbers are good, but these numbers can be in interpreted in different reports. But we took this from USDA and labor, and so we'll go through some of the numbers here. If you think about uh, why, the, why the veterinary matters in your community, that $22 billion in direct input uh, and, and the 571,000 jobs, that's 2020, so that's dated. But you think about the value of that, the, the average practice uh, uh, revenues, you see the differences though. Rural practice, $460,000 average, urban practice, $734,000. But the underpinning, so you think about the way Farm Journal works, we look at a system and we think, for, uh, and we think of a system as a series of gears all different sizes. And if the system's gonna work, all the gears have to be turning and working well. Sometimes the smaller gears don't work well and it holds up the system. We saw that during COVID. We saw that when inspection couldn't happen. But what we look at is those wheels need to turn and the only way to get them turning is collaborative work. They require multiple stakeholders. But the, the reason that they're smaller is they're not gonna hit the top priorities of any of the organizations and stakeholders involved. For instance, National Cattlemen, great partners. Farm Bureau, great partners. But if you look at your policy platform here, this is not on there. So now three years ago, we raised our hand and said, we're going to step into this. And the other group said, please do. This is critically important. So that's, that's how we work. We pick the small wheels in this system to get them moving. And you look at the other numbers there. But the one at the bottom, and this is a big one too, the shortages are not just, when you think about rural for, for livestock practices there, you're also thinking about disease outbreak and control. You think about high path, you think about African swine fever, and you think the ability for the U.S. agriculture to be able to have a safe system to export and for our own, to feed our own population, critically important. We'll talk about that in a moment. So some of the data behind this and things that are threatening the, the shortages. So in, uh, the, this is 2022. So uh, NIFA, National Institute for Food and, Food and Agriculture, they run a couple of programs, the Veterinary Loan Repayment Program and the Veterinary uh, uh, Services Grant Programs. The state vets need to, to submit shortage areas. Those shortage areas, uh, they, they vary by state on how many they can, they can submit, but then a vet has to apply and then has to be accepted, and those vary, it's a $25,000 up to three years, so $75,000 total. The Veterinary Service Grant Program is a $100,000 grant uh, that helps sustain the practice. It does not buy brick and mortar. But if you think about this, so la uh, in 2022, there were 226 shortage areas submitted, and that's five over, including 500 counties. But two thirds of those areas have been uh, vacant for five years or more. And the shortages can be rural, they can be in public service, and they can also be in the education system. You think about your vet schools. Uh, the average debt for the applicants. Now, this is interesting. So the applicant average debt was $163,000, but if you pull that out and put it against the all, total average debt for most vet students, it's closer to $200,000 in, in, in student debt. And so when you think about the average wage opportunities in rural versus urban, 
uh, and, and small animal practices, it, it, the debt to salary ratio starts to get out, out of whack. And so that's one of, the, one of the things we want to look at. But the other thing is retention. So even if they're graduating, you've got three to 4% of them uh, that are going into food animal systems. Now, some universities have a better percentage, so this is a national average. But the issue is that they're only making up 5% of the national veterinary population, and the retention rate is dropping all the time. And, and we need to address that uh, in, in a big way. So when you got that complicated of a problem, how do you start? You get smart people around the table. So this is a list that has grown to nearly 50 uh, now in this, in, as we go into our third year. So this is a mapping coalition. We engage these groups, and, and I like to, like to say that what we did is we put them around the table, we had them sit in a chair, and then there's a pin in the chair, in the seat. And if that pin hurts and they get up, then you need to be at the table. If you're just slightly uncomfortable, well then, we'll keep you there, but you can sit to the side. And if it doesn't hurt at all, but it's a matter of, of uh, you know, then stay in the room. So we got to there. You get the, oh, all right. Can we get back on the, you got it? All right. So we did policy research papers based on this, this mapping group. And we got through a lot of it, uh, helping out the, uh, I'll go back to this one. There we go. This one helps support the, the, uh, the policy work on the, on the uh, veterinary uh, loan repayment programs. And then we get into the solution mapping. Let's, in the last parts of it, I want to talk. So we've got three areas in the, in the way that we solve these things in solution-based. We've got to get a pipeline built. This is building the pipeline and engaging students. We've got to get a solutions mapping coalition that changes and evolves as we work through this system. And, and in this phase, this is about community readiness. It is not up to the vet to replace themselves only. It's not up to the vet school to fill the spot. The community's got to know that there's a need for a vet. They've got to know the livestock population and, and what's, what the needs are, and the recruiting's got to start. If you think you're going to go to the senior class at the vet school and recruit, you're going to be sorely missed. You missed that boat eight years ago. And, and if you go from eight to six to four to two, every year, every two years that, that you wait, the, the, the challenge is even harder. And then we'll continue to work on our veterinary ambassador, ambassador program, much like our farmer ambassador program to, to elevate the issues. We've got an online hub that we're piloting right now. I'll get into this. We've got nine university partners. You see them there. This, this online hub is to be able to stop vet students and vets at the time that they need to stop to think about the things they need to think about. And you think about academic rigor, financial acumen, knowing what, how to manage the debt, how to get into practices, how to sustain the career. And then the early career practitioners, this is about lifestyle changes, the new financial models and practices, but also knowing how to get into a community. And this is where we think Farm Bureau is a great partner for us. The community component is really critical. The, the community readiness and stakeholder, this initial evaluation, these, we've got them in three groups. A state either just hasn't started, a state has been working on it a little bit, or they've actually got a plan and they're ready to implement. Kentucky Department of Ag just released their plan this year and we've been a part of that the last 18 months. But we have the ability to engage each of the states to help them work through this process. We're not creating a national program that we manage, we're creating a, a system that allows resources and the best of the best to come to you and then we back out once you're going. We'll be there if we need you, but we do not want to run a national program. This has got to be sustained within the state and local communities. So looking ahead in 2024, uh, we're happy to have USDA, both the APHIS and FSIS on, on board. Uh, the, they have the shortages. They're all uh, you know, recruiting from the same pools. We've got the, the nine ed education uh, uh, partners in there at the university level. We will go to scale then with the corrections and, and enhancements in, in the fall 24. The ambassadors will be, the, be there. We'll work with NASDA, but we've got three to five states that we're going to work with this year, and then we'll be back, and we'd love to talk to you some more. So we're excited about this. It is a very complicated issue, uh, but we have some things, and we have the right people at the table and a ton of support. We want to help you. So we'll be around. If you, you need any, have any questions, we, we would love to and entertain and, and appreciate what you all are doing. We got to make sure I look good. <laughs> well, good afternoon, Salt Lake City. 
Good afternoon, Farm Bureau. Thank you all for spending a little bit of time with us here in beautiful Salt Lake, beautiful Utah. And isn't it ironic that we all come from across the country to Salt Lake City, which is known for snow, and it is warmer <laughs> here than most places all across the country. Um, but great, great to come to Salt Lake. Thank you all for spending a little bit of time with us here on the trade show floor. Want to uh, introduce uh, a very good friend of Farm Bureau, a very good friend of Utah Farm Bureau. Uh, but first, let me introduce myself. I'm Sam Kiefer. I serve as Vice President for Public Policy at the American Farm Bureau Federation. And I have the pleasure of spending the next 30 minutes with the newly elected Congresswoman from Utah, uh, Celeste Malloy. Thank you. <laughs> am I on? I am on. Um, Congresswoman Malloy represents Utah's second congressional district, uh, a position to which she was just elected only a few months ago in a special A few weeks ago. A few weeks ago. I haven't even hit two months. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but she grew up in rural Nevada. Nevada. And you have to say it like Apple. I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an East Coast guy. I, know, I, I say know. everything wrong. I'm converting the whole country one conversation at a time. Nevada. Thank you. Thank you. Nevada. It's Nevada. All right. I'm, I'm a changed man. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I appreciate that. And so does the state of Nevada. <laughs> <laughs> she came to Utah, Southern Utah University, to uh, get your bachelor's degree, after yes. which she spent approximately 10 years yep. uh, working for USDA's Natural Resource Conservation Service. So yep. she's, she spent a decade working beside farmers and ranchers, then attended Brigham Young to get her law degree. Yep. And she is uh, uh, she's an attorney who's done water law. Um, uh, here in Utah for quite a number of years, and the last several years spent time working for a Utah congressman in the congressional district where she now represents. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Congresswoman Celeste Malloy. Thank you. I brought my fan club. <laughs> So in, in uh, Congress, she serves on the uh, House Transportation and Infrastructure Committee, which is wildly important to the yeah. issues of rural America and agriculture specifically, yep. and on the Small uh, Business Committee. Again, agriculture is indeed a small business, and every, every uh, member who's here today is not just a farmer and a rancher, but also a small businessman or woman. So thank you for uh, those committee selections and appreciate your, your leadership on, uh, on the issues that are important to uh, uh, rural America. Um, I do want to start off because we, we, we talked about the fact that she, it's only been a few weeks since she uh, won the special election uh, for the uh, uh, Utah's second congressional district. So let me ask, having served as a staffer in Congress and now being the person whose name is on the door, what's the biggest difference? That's the question everybody asks me. Um, and the biggest difference is I have my own bathroom now. <laughs> so as a staffer, I had to go out in the hall and down, you know, to the public restroom, and now I have my very own tiny little bathroom in my office. Um, and I am very much enjoying that privacy, although it took me about four weeks to go into that bathroom <laughs> because I'm in the same office that my old boss was in. Yeah. Uh, they don't move everybody around in the middle of a Congress, so I just walked it back into the same office that I used to serve in, and now I sit at the big desk and I can use the private bathroom, and that is a really strange feeling. Yeah. The, the job has its perks. It does. Not that many. <laughs> <laughs> so you've been um, serving the agriculture and rural industry for, for quite some yeah. time. And um, you know, now that you are, you, you, you've taken that step to be a public servant, you, you, you've been serving agriculture. Yeah. You threw your hat, your name in the hat to run for Congress. Yeah. Uh, talk to us a little bit about how that decision process came to be, and frankly, if you would do it again. Wow, uh, this is the wrong time to ask me the last question. <laughs> I, I feel like uh, I don't have any kids, but I feel like I'm still in the delivery room, and people are asking me about when I'm going to have my next baby, and it, it's a little too soon. Um, this time a year ago, I would never have dreamed I would ever run for Congress. It wasn't a a goal I had, it wasn't anything that was on my radar. I like solving problems. I liked being a staffer. I liked solving problems for people in Utah, specifically rural Utah. And the day after Memorial Day, I found out my boss was resigning. And then I had to decide how I was going to keep solving problems when, when the, the job I was in was no longer an option. And Congressman Stewart, pulled me aside and told me he thought I should run. 
and I thought he was joking at first. I said, no one would ever vote for me. Everything I've done has been in someone else's name. Um, but I am really good at solving problems. And he said, just think about it. Go home and sleep on it, and then come back and talk to me tomorrow. And the next day, I came in and said, yeah, I'm not saying no anymore. I think, I think I'll try. What have I got to lose? Uh, and, you know, the journey of a 1,000 miles starts with one step. That's right. I took that one step, and that led to another step and another step, and now here I am. I've been a member of Congress for all of seven weeks now. And I don't know, well, if you ask if I would do it again, I'm already doing it again. I filed to run again two weeks ago. So I had four weeks to enjoy being a member of Congress, and now I'm back on a ballot. Well, you've got a, uh, an amazing relationship with uh, your constituents. Yeah. You know, in just a few minutes before we came on stage, um, I actually had to separate you from constituents. <laughs> uh, you, you're very well regarded, uh, uh, but not just by the, uh, the voters, but also Utah Farm Bureau. They tell me about the great relationship they have with you, not yeah. only while you're in office and as a candidate, but throughout your career. Yeah. And, and that is important. And, and, and as you may know, you know, American Farm Bureau and state farm bureaus do a, uh, uh, do a lot of work working with candidates and trying to help uh, our own members understand yeah. what it takes to be in elected office and in some cases motivate and provide the tools and mechanism yeah. to make that decision to run for office. So thank you for taking that step forward. It's a very important. You're welcome. And I really appreciate the, re the relationship I have with Utah Farm Bureau and with American Farm Bureau. Um, it's been integral in my career for a long time. I've, I've been a member of Congress for a really short period of time, but I've been working on agriculture issues my entire adult life. And Farm Bureau has always been really supportive, and I love what Farm Bureau does to try to get people involved in public life. It's if you just keep your head down and run your own agriculture operation, then a lot of things are going to happen to you. If you get involved in public life, then you're going to be at the table when those decisions are made. So you've been a member of Congress for a, a few weeks, uh, yeah. but you've worked on Capitol Hill before yeah. that, and you've seen agriculture and farmers and ranchers advocate on, on our own behalf. Yeah. Uh, but now that you're in the chair, what uh, insight would you have to our members uh, here and across the country about when, when we go into a congressional office, yeah. what should be on our mind, and, and, and what sh how, how should we make those asks? Well, the first thing I want to say is that showing up really is important. Those fly-ins, walking into your congressman's office, walking into your senator's office, makes a big difference. Um, it's, it's really easy as a staffer. I mean, it's just kind of what happens by default. You end up working on what's in front of you. Nobody has very much time to stop and step back and look at the big picture and say, what should we be working on? You work on what comes in the door. Um, and so if, if farmers are coming in the door, you're paying attention to their issues. If they're not, then they end up getting sifted to the bottom of the pile, whether you mean to or not. Um, I tried as a staffer, and I'm trying as a member of Congress, to be, to be the one who shows up, to be here in Utah, to be reaching out to Utah Farm Bureau, to be showing up at people's farms, to be in touch with my constituents who are facing ag issues. Um, and it, it's a lot of work. It takes a lot of attention. It's easier when people are reaching out to me and making sure I know when, I mean, Utah Farm Bureau let me know that they were having a board meeting yesterday, and I ended up having some free time I didn't expect, so I showed up at their board meeting. Um, those kind of contacts, those kind of touches really matter. And I know I, I have a lot of family that's involved in agriculture, and you know I, I ran for Congress, and they're like, nah, I don't know my congressman. I'm busy. I have a business to run. I don't care what's happening in Congress. Congress is useless. And they're not even completely wrong. They're, they have some valid points. But if you're not showing up, they're not thinking about you. One of, the, uh, one of the cliches of, of those of us who, who uh, make a, a living, a profession out of advocating on, on our members' behalf, it, we, we often say that you know, advocacy is a contact sport. Yeah. And uh, it, like you said, just showing up makes a difference. We're in the people business. It's, it's a relationship. And I've, I've seen the relationship that you and Utah Farm and your constituents have. And I don't want to put you on the spot. But as, okay. as I interact with, with uh, farmers and ranchers and Farm Bureau members from across the country, I, let, uh, I tell them that in my, in my experience, every member of Congress and staffer has one of these. Yeah. Well, some of my staffers don't have theirs yet. Ah. Be patient with <laughs> us. It's only been a few weeks. But as, as, uh, you know, as, as somebody who walks the halls and you know, visits with members of Congress, you know, we're making asks. Yep. And we recognize that I am not a constituent of yours. Yeah. But when Farm Bureau shows up, we represent the folks back home. Yep. And chances are, you know, whether it's an elected official or a staffer, after we leave, you're going to want to call somebody back home. 
yep. and say, hey, Sam was just here and he said we should do this. And the, 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 the hope is that you know, the phone number of your constituents is in your phone, that they're calling the Farm Bureau, you're calling the Farm Bureau members yep. that, have, that are saying the same things that they tell us to do during our business session that we'll see be in a few days. So yeah. my suggestion to, and again, apologize for doing this, my <laughs> suggestion to Farm Bureau members across the country is if you don't already have the cell phone number of your elected to Congress, uh, get your number in their phone and get yeah. their phone number in your phone. Yeah, and it know is their a staff. Point. And know their staff. Know the staff in your state, know the staff in Washington, D.C. So as a former staffer, I'm trying to make sure I build my office this way to begin with, and we have a rule in my office that we don't introduce a piece of legislation, we don't sign on to a letter until we've called somebody in the district who's affected by it and ask them you know, how it would impact them. And, and that's the reason, because if we have those kind of relationships, if they know my staff and they talk to my staff regularly, then it's easy to call and say, why are you doing this thing that you thought would be good for, say, the beef industry, but I, I raise cattle and it's not good for me. If they don't know how to get a hold of us, then somebody's just at home, you know, over dinner, griping about Congress and how we're making their lives harder, which is fair. Every American household should have dinners like that. Um, but if you can call me or my staff and say, this would have a negative impact on us, then we're going in with better information and we're better representatives. We can't represent people we're not talking to. Well said, thank you. Thank you. So at, as a member of the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee, again, there, there's a lot going on within that committee, very yep. broad jurisdiction, yep. and important jurisdiction over issues facing agriculture, one of which being waters of the United States, an yes. issue that you've worked for a long, long time. I have. Um, you, as you well know, that is an issue that the Supreme Court's weighed in, the United States uh, Environmental Protection Agency, made some changes. We yep. still think there's a lot of room for improvement. Um, there is. So in addition to um, the waters of the United States, what other areas do you see as opportunity for uh, members of the Transportation Infrastructure Committee? I see a lot of them. One of the first that comes to mind is um, trucking issues. So I've, I've already been in some hearings where we talked about transportation and trucking, and I've gotten calls from Utah Farm Bureau. I've gotten calls from you know, cattle ranchers in Utah who are worried about transportation issues. Uh, and that isn't something that fits neatly into the category of ag policy. And yet it has a big impact on how we do ag policy and how people on the ground do their jobs and market their products. Um, so that's one of the things that when I say pick up the phone when something's going on, it doesn't necessarily have to be something coming out of the agriculture committee or something that's purely ag related. There are a lot of things we do in Congress. Uh, one of the examples I used all the time on the campaign trail, people talk about inflation. You know, I would say, well, we were energy independent four years ago, and we're not now. And when we're not energy independent, the cost of fuel goes up. And when the cost of fuel is higher, the cost of food is higher. I mean, all of these things have an impact on agriculture. And two years ago, when I was a staffer, Utah Farm Bureau was in town and I was trying to set up some meetings for them and I said I can reach out to the Ag Committee, I can reach out to, you know, I talked about a bunch of people that I instinctively thought they'd want to talk to and the President said, that's great, but we hear from those people a lot. Why don't you set us up with some meetings with people who aren't on Ag Committees but are doing things that impact our business that we don't hear from all the time? And since we had that conversation, I try to think that way. When, when Farm Bureau's in town, I think, what do we have going on, say, in transportation? or small business that is going to impact the way farmers in Utah do their jobs, but they're not hearing from them all the time. Yeah. So as a member of the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee, again, we talked a little bit about, uh, or I talked about waters of the United States. Yeah. You're a water attorney. I used to be. Used to be. <laughs> <laughs> now you've got other headaches. I don't know what I am now. <laughs> um, there, again, we, we are in you know, the Great Salt Lake Valley. We yep. are in the West and the water conversations in the West are drastically different than the water conversations in the Midwest and on the East Coast. Yes. Um, you, you've got a, a perspective that a lot of other members of Congress do not have, having spent you know, uh, multiple years working side by side, farmers and ranchers, on yes. water issues. Where are some opportunities uh, that, that you see that you can uh, uh, help advocate for, for water retention, better water retention policies, water usage policies at the federal level? So this is one of those areas where showing up really, really matters. I've spent a lot of time working water policy and it's kind of tricky because water is a state issue for the most part. There are some 
interstate water issues that fall under federal jurisdiction. Um, and so I have a lot of water ideas, but I am in the federal government and the state should be leading on this. And the really important thing for people in agriculture to understand with water is everybody cares about water right now. It's not a matter of um, agriculture just staying insular. It, when, when cities get thirsty, they're gonna look to farms to find water. And this is where showing up is absolutely essential for the future of these businesses. You've, you've got to know who your water policy people are in the state. You've gotta be really engaged. And then I'm trying to stay really engaged with water policy people in the state because like with the Great Salt Lake, the water levels are dropping. Everybody's fairly panicked about that. Whatever the state decides to do to address that, they're gonna require federal funding and federal programming. Um, and so we're all gonna have to work on it together. It's gonna take farmers, the states, and the federal government having a lot of water conversations and throwing out a lot of bad ideas that seem like good ideas until you realize how they're going to impact people who use water. Another Western issue that is very well understood in these parts, but often not even thought of uh, on the East Coast or, or in some other areas, is the, the issue of how uh, ranchers need to uh, interact with uh, and deal with federally protected wild horses. Um, again, yes. that, 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 it, it's an issue that it's certainly not new. And no. as you've experienced, you know, uh, members of Congress you know, are always sometimes focused on the issue du jour. Yeah. And right now, there's not a, many, not a whole lot of folks in Washington talking about the issue. No. What do you see as both the challenges and you know, opportunities to advance the, some of the, uh, the, the conversations about wild horses and burrows? So this is one of those things like peace in the Middle East. We're probably going to talk about it for the rest of our lives. And I don't know that anyone's ever going to get a Nobel Peace Prize for it. Um, but we do have issues out here in the West that the, the rest of my colleagues in Congress never have to think about. Wild horses is a really great example. It affects about seven states. It really, really impacts about three or four. Um, and, and when you're talking to members of Congress about wild horses, I have to go talk to members from Kentucky and Tennessee and some of these places where people love their horses right. and, and cannot wrap their brains around the idea that a horse might be a nuisance um, or that a, a horse might just be living in the wild and, and nobody's responsible for it. So Congress in 1971 declared wild horses part of the natural environment, which biologically they're not, and now that's the legal framework we have to operate in, which means in order to solve these problems we have in the West Desert in Utah that very few people see, it takes an act of Congress. Um, and I'm gonna sound like a broken record here, but this is where showing up matters. So there's some people sitting here right now who've been part of this. Uh, they kept knocking down my former boss's door, saying we have to do something on wild horses. And he became the wild horse guy on Capitol Hill. And we've made some changes. We've ch made changes in the way federal land management agencies um, manage horse populations. We're not there yet, but it's, we're, we're making progress. And I think that's a success story because it's not something that most people want to talk about. It's not something that most people need to talk about, but it's absolutely essential for some small, low population states in the West. Another issue that is unique to Western states, but specifically Utah, is the amount of federal land yeah. uh, within, within the state borders. Uh, so from, from, from a tax roll perspective to also land use decisions, yep. um, I invite you to t talk about you know, some of the things uh, where you think Congress and the federal government can be a better partner to the agriculture community on, on multiple use of federal lands. Yeah, we, we could be a better partner in all of the ways on federal lands. Um, the, the fact that the federal government manages the majority of the land in several western states is something that's hard to even explain uh, to my colleagues who live you know, east of Colorado. Um, and then, then it's hard to help people understand that when the federal government manages most of the land, our local governments are going through federal processes to do the basic things that local governments do. They have to go through a federal process to maintain roads, to put in power lines, to put in pipelines, sometimes to find land to build a school on. They've got to go work out a trade with a federal agency because we have these little towns and they're totally landlocked by federal land. And it's something that I think people have gotten savvier and savvier on the longer I've worked in policy. Now when I talk to my colleagues, um, you know, Bruce Westerman's the chair of House Natural Resources. He's from Arkansas. This is not a problem they have in Arkansas, but he understands the problem now. Right. Um, and, and that's what it's gonna take. And I talk a lot about showing up and talking to your own member of Congress, but members of American Farm Bureau from the West need to be talking to their counterparts from other states. 
when, when organizations like yours are lobbying members who don't have these problems, it really helps move the needle. Utah can't change policy alone. Utah and Nevada together can't change policy. But if we have members from Arkansas and Guam and New York also participating in these conversations, then we're going to get somewhere. And that's the beauty of a, a, a national organization like, like ours, and specifically a federation like, like ours, yeah. is that, that the power of the grassroots truly truly does echo because uh, as, as diverse as one state is, we are even more diverse with, with agriculture all across the country. Yep. And you know, the, the, the work that our delegates will be doing on, on Tuesday, you know, trying to solve problems, you know, an idea could from, come from Kentucky, and at the end of the day, if we agree on it, then, then the entire organization uh, yep. from, from, from Maine to California will, 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 will get behind that and, and row in the same direction. Now, I talk a little bit about you know, the, the world of advocacy being a relationship business and a contact sport, um, but I, I also try to make sure that we have a little bit of fun and you know, find a way that we can you know, be memorable as advocates to, with elected officials. So, pardon me, but we are in the Beehive State. We are. Utah is known as the Beehive State, so I had to take the opportunity to wear my socks that have bees on them in the Beehive State, thank so the you. Congresswoman will remember me. <laughs> it, it matters, it does matter, and thank you for the, you know, the attention to detail. I appreciate that you know that this is the Beehive State. John Curtis, my, my colleague in the Utah delegation, is known for his socks. I am not. I'm not gonna show you what socks I'm wearing. It wouldn't impress anybody. But I did wear Beehive earrings the night I got sworn into Congress, just as a reminder of who I am and where I'm from and what I'm doing, so. Thank you for that. Well, I, I'm from Pennsylvania. We're the Keystone State, and yes. Keystones are not terribly exciting. A beehive is a... Uh, it's is, cheap is, beer, is, though, right? Uh, yes, very so much so. That. Very much so. Yes, yes. Uh, the, the theme of this convention is New Frontiers, and you, in many ways, have ventured in a new frontier by, by taking that step to be an elected uh, uh, official representing constituents in Utah's second congressional district. And we have the great opportunity to bring Americans, farmers and ranchers from all across the country to Utah, to the West. You've spent your life in the West working on Western rural issues. I have. What would you want those who are visiting the West or Utah for the first time to know about Utah agriculture, Nevada agriculture, <laughs> and agriculture in the West? Um, well, the first thing I would want them to know, I'm glad everybody's here because I. I found on the when you're having these conversations on the national level, people don't think of the West as agriculture production, except maybe California. Um, and and we are an ag state. We just don't have the same kind of agriculture that the Midwest has. And when it comes to making agriculture policy, I think a lot of the time and attention gets spent on large farms in the Midwest. But we have unique problems here in the Inner Mountain West that are also important in those agriculture conversations. I remember as a staffer going to talk to an ag committee staffer about public lands grazing when they were working on a farm bill and he was like, look, I don't, I don't have time to worry about grazing because that's just such a small part of animal production agriculture. Uh, so I'm glad that everybody's here and seeing how engaged and excited Utah Farm Bureau is and how important the ag community is here even though it's a different kind of agriculture than what you would see in you know, Nebraska. So for, for, for those who, who are not from Utah, like myself, can you yeah. uh, describe your congressional district from a production standpoint? I, as I understand yeah. it, the bulk of the tart cherries are grown in your district, is that right? I don't know if it's the bulk, but Utah produces a lot of tart cherries. We used to be a big um, orchard state. A lot of my district is dry, and we have a lot of uh, people who grow alfalfa, and we have a lot of people who are, they don't own a lot of land, they do a lot of public land grazing. And that's one of the things that is really unique in the West, where you have base property and then your animals graze on public land. So when Forest Service or Bureau of Land Management is making a rule, that has a big impact on Utah agriculture. When I talk to people in Washington, D.C. about these rules, they don't think about agriculture, they think about recreation. They, they, they're thinking about open space and land management, not what it does to a family that's raising cattle and trying to put food on the table. Um, so that's one of the most unique things in this district about agriculture. But also, my district goes from you know, about an hour north of here to four hours south of here. Uh, and so it ranges from high mountain, you know, short growing season 
to hot desert, long, long growing season, not much water. So we've got a, a really diverse agricultural uh, variety in Utah because of our climate, because of our geography. And when we were talking about, when you were talking about the federal lands uh, uh, interaction, one of the things that I think is unique to, to the West and particularly Utah is when Farm Bureau and Farm Bureau members knock on your door, when you go to seek a solution, it's not always on the door of USDA, which you knock. Sometimes you're knocking right. on other agencies like Department of Interior. Um, yes. Can, can you talk a little bit about you know, your interactions with agencies who may not be thinking about agriculture first? Yeah, so I, I spend a lot more time with the Department of Interior than I do with the Department of Ag. And usually when I'm talking to the Department of Agriculture, it's Forest Service, not you know the, the crop agencies. And I, I think I, even the agencies are surprised sometimes when I show up and I'm talking about agriculture issues. And some of them are things that even people in Utah are surprised by. For example, I've been the last couple of years talking to the Forest Service about bees. So we have beekeepers in Utah bees. who want to be able to put bees, we are the beehive state, on Forest Service land. And they're saying, no, they don't belong on forest land because they compete with native pollinators. They want them down on farmland, but on farmland, we use pesticides. And so these are the kind of you know issues we have to work out when you have most of the land being managed by federal agencies. You have to learn how to make the lives we live compatible with the way federal agencies are managing their land. And it, it is an everyday thing. It's not every once in a while something crops up in the news and people across the country say, wow, I hadn't really thought about what you have to deal with out west. But for us, it's an everyday thing. We're always dealing with federal issues. Congressman, you've been gracious with your time. But let, I'd like to ask one more question before, before we uh, um, you know, part ways for the day. When, when you made the decision to, to run for Congress, um, what, what was that thing that pushed you over the edge to say yes and take that step forward versus no, I'm going to stand back? Well, it was probably a combination of panic and low blood sugar, but that is <laughs> not, not the answer that you're looking for, I know. Really and truly, I thought somebody has to keep working on these issues. Um, and there are a lot of members of Congress who like to talk about big national issues, the kind you see on cable news. And you could spend an entire career in public service working on those issues and never solve any problems at home for your constituents. And I personally think that representatives should spend the majority of their time on the local issues that matter to their constituents. And I got to a point where I knew that I could either hope that somebody who cared about that ran for the seat and took care of the people that I really care about, or I could run and make sure that I'm that kind of member and that I'm taking care of the people I really care about and that I'm having those conversations with federal agencies, that I'm sitting on key committees that matter to the people at home. And that's what put me over the edge and made me decide to run. And I'll tell you, I've said this on the campaign trail, but this is a different audience. This job is just not as glamorous as it looks from the outside. <laughs> And I had been close enough to the inside, I knew that. I know that when you do this job well, you are, you're gonna be criticized no matter what you do. I'm, I'm exhausted all the time. I get you know, about the amount of sleep per week that I used to get per night. Um, and no matter how hard you try, people are always gonna think you could do more. So I went in knowing that. The reason it's worth it is because when I get phone calls from this one's not an ag thing, but when I get a phone call from a veteran who says, I need help and I can't get through to the VA, and we can get them in to somebody to get help, that's what keeps me going. That's what representation should look like. And, and that's why showing up matters. That's why public service is so important. It gets a bad rap sometimes. But that's why the kind of advocacy that Farm Bureau does is so important too. When you can match up good advocacy with good public service, we can make magic happen sometimes in the areas where people have just gotten frustrated and decided that nothing's ever gonna get better. And if, if I can keep doing that, and if you can keep doing that with me, then hopefully I'm back here in you know, however many years it is before you come back to Utah, and we can have a conversation about all the great things we've done and all the wins we've had. Can consider that a deal. Okay. Absolutely. And I'll wear cool socks. Uh, wonderful. <laughs> 
So, Celeste, thank you for joining thank us. You. Appreciate all that you've done, not only in your sh short time in Congress, but on behalf of, of Utah Agriculture, American Agriculture. And thank you for taking that step forward to lead. We very much appreciate it. Thank Ladies you. and gentlemen, please join me in thanking Congresswoman Celeste Malloy. Thank you all for sitting and listening to us when you could be getting handouts at the booths. <laughs> <laughs> thank you.